About a month ago, we did a series of episodes describing how St. John Bosco basically became an ER doctor to help cholera patients during the epidemic in Turin. But did you know that St. John Bosco actually contracted cholera himself? Today we're going to tell the story of how he offered up his sickness so that the dogma of the Immaculate Conception be officially declared. The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Subscribe for new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. On August 1st, 1854, Pope Pius IX granted a holy year and invited the faithful to penance and pray to the Lord under the patronage of Mary Most Holy Immaculate, that he might remove or mitigate the chastisements threatening the world. Among other reasons, the Pope requested that all bishops and faithful implore the goodness of the Father of Mercies, that he might enlighten our souls with the light of his Holy Spirit. In November, Don Bosco printed his booklet with the De Augustini Press, The Jubilee and Devout Practices for the Visitation of the Churches and Catholic Readings. In it, Don Bosco published the papal encyclical, and the preface read, To the Reader. The primary purpose of this booklet is to acquaint the Christian faithful with the true origin of the Jubilee and how it passed from the synagogue to the Catholic Church. I have made it my conscientious duty to consult the oldest and most accredited of writers, stopping short of transcribing anything that presented any doubt about the truth. Some religious practices are added according to what is prescribed by the Roman pontiff in granting the present Jubilee. This will serve to refute the accusation that Protestants and some bad Catholics make against the Catholic Church, as if the Jubilee and Holy Indulgences were an institution of recent times. Read carefully, O Christian. Who knows that it is not the last Jubilee for us? It's lucky for all Christians if they've done right. Divine mercy awaits us. The heavenly treasures are open. May God make all know how to take advantage of them. Father John Bosco. The December pamphlet was timely because of the blasphemies against Our Lady by the sectarians. The booklet entitled, Considerations on the Expected Dogmatic Definition of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin and a Novena, was written by Father Costa of Rome. It outlined the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, the conduct of the Church regarding this doctrine, set forth the end that the Church proposed in the aforementioned dogmatic deliberation, and the duties to be imposed upon every Catholic because of this. These printouts were also signs of the Oratory's gratitude to Mary Most Holy, the promise so confidently made by Don Bosco to the youth having been fulfilled. The outcome was surprising even to a skeptic, at that time, the pupils of the hospice had already formed a family of nearly 100. Every house had to mourn its dead in the neighborhood where cholera raged. Yet, after a four-month-long epidemic, no one at the oratory had succumbed. The disease circumvented them, advanced as far as the door of the oratory, and even penetrated Don Bosco's room. Still, it seemed as if an invisible hand was directing a retreat, sparing their lives. Amazingly, all the boys who had volunteered to the service of the sick were in excellent health. They seemed to have passed those days as if on a vacation. Hence, all who knew the matter marveled, as it was impossible not to discern the merciful hand of God's protection. Though the disease had penetrated into Don Bosco's room, we must add that it did assail him. Don Bosco had prayed to the Lord that if the disease should strike any of his boys, he would offer himself as a victim on their behalf. His mother Margaret told Don Bonetti that one evening, in that week in which cholera began to wreak havoc, after a day of great strain, Don Bosco went to bed and fell asleep. Soon he awoke feeling weak and cold and cramps in his feet and legs. His head was spinning and he suffered nausea. He felt all the symptoms of cholera. He was afraid of frightening the boys if he asked for help. He began to pray to the Blessed Virgin, resigning his fate to God's will. He gave himself the standard treatment for cholera, after which, holding the blanket and the sheets with both hands, he started to rub one with the other, and wiggling his feet and legs with such force that his whole body was bathed in sweat after 15 minutes. Don Bosco fell asleep in that state, waking up in the morning without any pain. This was the only case of cholera at the oratory. 
It must have been caused by charity towards his boys and an even more sublime motive, inspiring him to live the faith for the triumph of the church and Our Lady. From his words and writings, we have well-founded reasons to be convinced that Don Bosco had made God a generous offering of his life to obtain the proclamation of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception that year. It's also certain that he spoke with much praise of people who had taken such a vow in 1854. We believe that his suffering was proof that our Lord had accepted his sacrifice, and his recovery was an effect of the goodness of Mary Most Holy. The solemnity of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary was fixed on December 8th by the immortal pontiff, Pope Pius IX, in the Vatican Basilica. He was surrounded by 200 cardinals, patriarchs, archbishops, and bishops who had flocked from all over the world to solemnly proclaim the dogma of faith. On the morning of that memorable day, the boys of the hospice and many from the oratory devoutly approached the sacred sacraments of confession and holy communion in honor of Mary Immaculate, who had covered them with her mantle of motherly goodness. In the evening, Don Bosco prepared them for their thanksgiving. He spoke of the mystery of her mercy in a way suitable to them that had been defined on that day as a truth of faith. He then spoke of Mary's goodness and power for the benefit of her devotees, and then went on to say that they were called to thank heaven for protecting them from cholera. Don Bosco compared the scourge of cholera to the passage that referred to the exterminating angel in Egypt. To help them understand the benefit our Lord granted them, he described various sorrowful scenes in places in Liguria, Piedmont, Turin, and some houses in the neighborhood. Yes, my dear children, Let's thank God, for we have reason to do so, as you see. He has preserved us in life amidst a thousand dangers of death. So that our thanksgiving may be more pleasing to Him, let us unite it with a cordial and sincere promise to consecrate the rest of our days to Him alone, loving Him with all our hearts, practicing our faith, keeping the commandments of God and the Church, fleeing mortal sin, which is a disease infinitely worse than cholera and the plague. Having said this, he intoned the Te Deum, and the young people continued singing it with the liveliest gratitude and love. Who can describe how much Don Bosco loved Our Lady? After the Blessed Sacrament, his first devotion was to Blessed Mary. He continually recommended this devotion to everyone, preaching, confessing, and giving family talks with childlike tenderness. He always had blessed medals and images of Our Lady that he distributed, especially to the children who crowded around him, advising them to wear it devoutly and pray to Our Lady daily. To the boys of the oratory, he recommended that they recite five decades of the rosary daily. He even advised them to recite it partly while working and partly on their way to work or home. He assured them that the Holy Rosary was an excellent means of obtaining the virtue of purity and a sure defense against the wiles of the devil. He was the apostle of all those practices of piety that he knew were pleasing to the glorious Mother of God. After the Angelus, he had the three Gloria Patri added in many parishes in Piedmont, which at that time were not generally recited because he knew that they would be most pleasing to her. He then always began, continued, and finished all his works by invoking her. If he had to send circular letters, he instructed that they be sent on a date of one of her feasts, and sometimes he postponed sending them so that they would bear that date. Similarly, he endeavored to begin an undertaking or to hold a solemn gathering of his colleagues on a feast day. Every work he did, he attributed to Our Lady. In sermons and lectures, he repeated that whatever the oratory and the congregation did, everything had to be attributed to Mary's goodness. Throughout his life, he never undertook anything important without first entrusting his designs to her protection. The invocation he said the most was, Maria, Mater Grazie, Dulcis Parens Clemencie, Tu nos ab oste protege, et mortis ora suscipe. O Mary, Mother of Grace, Sweet Mother of Mercy, defend us against the enemy, and receive us at the hour of death. And for this devotion, Our Lady freely gave a solution to all his difficulties. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you'd like to hear about how St. John Bosco could read people's souls, just click on the link I've put on the screen. God bless you, and Our Lady keep you.